as the central fiber of a, of a family, uh, <coughs> with, with the C star action, as in the definition of stability. And then we want to um, argue that the Futaki invariant for this limiting value of this thing is, um, is zero. So I, I, I'm going to try to say something about these points. <coughs> but before, before doing that, let's sort of step back and um, talk in a, say a few words about the kind of foundations of studying these metrics with cone singularities. So remember that these are things that are modeled transverse to a divisor on the basic cone dr squared plus theta squared. <coughs> and in terms of a standard, if we take a standard complex coordinate, say z uh, transverse to d and say w, a number of w's along d, uh, so the divisor is locally defined by the equation z equals zero, then um, in this, in this basic, the, the, the model, um, we would take um, this z, the, the, these, these complex coordinates and these cone coordinates would be related by a formula like this. So what I mean by the foundations is that essentially we want to set up uh, a, an analog of the usual kind of linear elliptic theory. And in the usual way, just as when you do the usual analysis on manifolds, you start off with doing the flat case and then you treat the general case by perturbing about that. Uh, we can start off treating the sort of flat case where we have a we take the standard cone times <coughs> a Euclidean factor the W variable. <coughs> so what, what more precisely what do we we don't we're not going to attempt to define elliptic theory for for arbitrary operators. We want to consider really a very specific operator. That's to say. The, the, the crucial operator in the sort of complex Mont-Jamper theory, the, the crucial linear operator, is um, the composite of d bar d with the inverse of the Laplacian. Why is this? Why this is the thing? Which? Uh, why is this relevant? This is the thing that takes. Supposing we want to have a given change in the volume form. Which is what this complex Mont-Jamper is all about. Uh, that's given by um, solving the Laplace equation, and then that gives the change in the Kähler potential. The change in the metric is given by taking d bar d. So this is the this is the linearization of the operator. The change in the volume form goes to the change in the metric. And what we want is this to be a, a bounded operator. Uh, with respect to essentially the same function space, roughly speaking. And uh, the, the, the conventional thing you would use in the standard case would be, or well, one conventional thing would be Hölder spaces, and that's what we want to do. So we bound, want bounded. So it's even actually, it's not really quite clear even what this means uh, initially because uh, the, the, I mean the, the output of this is going to be a 1-1 form 
what do we mean in this conical situation? What do we mean to compare the values of a one-one form at different places? It's not quite clear how to set it up. What we um, what we mean by that is that we'll express we can write down a standard basis for the um, it's an orthonormal basis for the one-one forms. Given if we write eta is dr plus i beta r d theta then we can write down a standard basis of the form so eta wedge eta bar um, so dw schematically wedge uh, eta bar and dw wedge to dw bar kind of a schematic notation so what we mean here is that we express the, the components of this with respect to this basis and we want this to be Hölder in the ordinary sense So for that, we want to understand the, 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 the Green's function of this Laplacian. So there are, um, I mean, I'm not an expert on all this, there are, there are at least two approaches to this. <coughs> One is uh, to say that this is essentially something which has been studied for hundreds of years because in a slightly different context it appears like side variant of it, if you're doing potential theory on a, a wedge in R3, it's essentially the same problem. So there are lots of fascinating papers from about 1910, from the traditional mathematical physics papers, writing these things down with Bessel functions and all sorts of stuff. Alternatively, there are modern kind of high technology theories, so one can alternatively try to read papers by um, Melrose and Matzeo and people like that. So they're both probably about equally <laughs> difficult reading projects. Anyway, I, I, I'm sort of following more the first, but the, but there is a all of this can probably be well, that is embedded in much bigger theories. Um, and I say this this has all been developed by um, more in a more systematic and general way by in the paper of. Jeffries, Matzeo, and Rubinstein. In any case, all I, all I want to say is that you have to be careful in doing this, and I want to explain that the, the, the things are not as completely straightforward as you might first think. The following reason, I mean, this is, this is a function of two variables, but supposing we, um, we fix one variable to be some fixed point away from the divisor, and we just think of g of P0, let me think as a function of this one variable. Then um, this thing has an expansion uh, about the divisor, which contains terms of the form r to the 1 over beta, say cos theta plus lots of stuff, but you get terms of this kind coming in. So when we're doing what we have to do to understand this operator. I mean, if, we, if we put an arbitrary second order operator in here, we'd have to differentiate this thing twice to see what we're going to get. But if we take two derivatives in the r direction, this will bring in an r to the 1 over beta minus 2 cos theta. So you see that if beta is, things get worse as beta gets bigger. If beta is uh, bigger than a half, this thing is not even bounded. You get a singularity. Is this a green function on the compact manifold, or is it a green function uh, on the complement of the divisor with some boundary condition? No, I, I, I'm solving the model problem on, let's, let's bring in notation. Let's, let's write C beta for the, the standard cone or the plane with this metric, with the corresponding metric. So I'm taking the model problem on this this flat space, where one can write out the Green's function explicitly in terms of but there are no boundary conditions near the wedge or something like that. Uh, no, I, I, the, forget the wedge. I was just saying that the, the same things do appear. Yes. But in, in my version, I'm just saying I'm considering a little plus operator for this conical metric on this sort of flat 
model where one can write down essentially that's, that, that's what I'm doing. Then later on, of course, you paste that into a compact manifold to do things there. <coughs> but the crucial thing this is bad if a beta is bigger than one half. So you, you don't, if you're too ambitious and you just put a general second order operator here, you won't get a bound on holder spaces in, in general. But fortunately, we don't have a general operator here. We have this particular one. Um, the, the, so essentially that, this second derivative with respect to R only occurs in, so we can write delta as say delta R theta plus delta W, schematically, as it's taking the Laplace in a different direction. The only place this operator occurs is inside here. So we can express, uh, if we take the derivative respect to W, we have no problem. We can express this in terms of the Laplacian, which is what we already know. Uh, beyond that, we only get terms in D by DR, of G, well, in of D by DW, it doesn't happen. That will just involve things like 1 over r to the beta minus 1, cos theta. And there we're just OK, because beta is, beta is less than 1, so this is slightly positive. So this will be in C alpha if alpha is less than 1 over beta minus 1. So this is what was. As I get to, as far as I get to take it, but w w what you conclude essentially by once you've done this, you can more or less follow the usual proof of the Schauder estimates uh, with some modifications to, to obtain these estimates. But um, you're only going to get it in this range of Hölder spaces, depending upon beta, and uh, it, it's sort of only worked because you had these. You didn't. You weren't considering general derivatives. You're only considering these particular derivatives. So one, one, one application of having that theory is that you can, um, once you have that so linear theory in place, you can relatively easily uh, solve the deformation problem to say if you have a solution for one angle, you can slightly increase the angle. In fact, let's say something about that, it's relevant. But for the deformation problem, Just to say something a bit more precise than what I just said. Uh, if you just write it down and you use the implicit function theorem to well, linearize the problem, you, um, you apparently might have a, a problem given by obstruction, given by holomorphic vector fields on x, which are tangent to d. If you have one of these, then there will be a a co-kernel of your operator, which would potentially obstruct this deformation. But um, it's it's quite an easy fact. This is done by um, by um, Jian Song and uh, Wang. That this is that th th there are no such thing. This space is zero <coughs> in general. So so although you apparently have this obstruction. Actually, when you look more carefully, it's always vanishes. So you can always do this deformation. This is assuming D is This is assuming D is Yes, yes, yes. So D is. Um, oh, in other yeah, in other situations. So as I say, D is in. Uh, some fixed multiple of uh, some fixed multiple. So before diving into the, you know, this, 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 this I mean, the, the kind of technical things. Let's um, let's 
give an example where one. Mm, so maybe what I'm going to say is not absolutely, one doesn't actually know precise proofs of every point, but, but it's, one, it's only an example where one <coughs> really understands how things should work if you tried this. So let's, let's try to do this program in a case where we know there's not a solution. So let's take CP2 bl and blow up at two points. So we know there's no Kähler-Einstein metric on this thing. So what, let's see what happens. We'll, we'll do this. So let's, let's take um, homogeneous coordinates x, y, z and blow up um, two points on the line at infinity. So we've got, this is also line at infinity. These are our two points. So we can, well, let's just take a, let's take a divisor in minus k. That's just given by a, a cubic curve passing through these two points. So, I can't quite draw it. So, <coughs> so a cubic through the two points. So the generic case will be then when it, this cubic meets the line to infinity and one further distinct point. So let's first we'll consider that. Then you can so essentially see what happens is that um, supposing our cubic is given by the equation p of x, y, z equals zero, then as you approach the limiting value where you're going to stop, um, this cubic is going to, in this case, the ambient space will stay the same, it's going to be projective space, but the, what will happen is that the cubic will degenerate into a singular curve, according to the fashion P of, uh, let's say, x, y, epsilon z equals zero, epsilon going to zero. So as, what will happen is that our our, our curve will degenerate by applying the one parameter subgroup that squashes everything towards x equals y equals zero. And in the limit, we'll get three lines. Like so. And that's where we'll stop because when we said this, I mean, so this was the smooth D, there are no singularities. Now, we've, when we've got this singular situation, we do have a by construction, whereas we have, and so we do, that sort of fits in that we do meet this obstruction, that's why we stop. Plus, of course, the fact that we've got some, we'll have some nasty singularity in our metric here as well. <coughs> Moreover, by um, calculations of uh, Gabor Zekalidi and, and Chi Li, one can work out exactly where we stop in this situation, um, and it's at, written down somewhere, so beta max is equal to 21 over 25. Yep. So, yep. We know exactly that. We'll go, we'll go that, that far and no further, <laughs> and then we'll get this picture here. On the other hand, um, okay, according to calculations of Zekliidi, if we took a special case where we had one of these was a double point, so we had a, we had a double intersection point, then we would go no, not quite so far. Seven over nine, which is, which is slightly smaller. In in the case of the sort of the special case, and then. Uh, well, actually, I don't quite. I, I'm less certain about what the picture would be in that case of how the curve degenerates. But presumably, one could figure out how it how it should be going on. So, so, so I mean, are we seeing the destabilizing test configuration? Sorry? Are we de seeing the destabilizing test configuration? That's right. This this thing will be the. I mean, the, the way you work this out is you work out when this Futaki invariant is zero yeah. for this this thing. But, the, but then that's for this one parameter subgroup. But if you take a the kind of the special case, there's another one parameter subgroup that stops you a bit before that. So that's why you've stopped to 
a slightly smaller angle. No. So this is not, so nothing to do with the, the proofs in general, but it's sort of comforting to see a case where one really at least feels one understands exactly what's um, happening. So let's now turn to the, well, you know, the <coughs> for me it's the, you know, the central problem, which is to extend what we did in the first lecture and a half to the case when we have these divisors. So remember that was all based upon, uh, we had the dromov hausdorff limit, and then we were able to relate that to algebra. Um, So one other kind of foundational thing, which I will say almost nothing about, is to show that, uh, in fact, we can, we can approximate these um, metrics with cone singularities by metrics with positive Ricci curvature. In fact, we can keep the, we can keep the, uh, such the metric as ar arbitrarily close to being a Kähler-Einstein metric away from the divisor and slightly smooth out this delta function of curvature to a big lump of something smooth but with very large positive Ricci curvature. Um, but just a, a, I mean, all that, it's not too surprising, but that requires some substantial proof. Uh, I mean, one point to make is that when we were, in our previous discussion of these L2 techniques and so on, we were looking at uh, formulae for involving the Ricci curvature, um, there we said we had a hypothesis that the Ricci was bounded, and that was all we needed to think around it. In this case, it's not going to be, I mean, in this family, it's not going to be bounded, but the crucial thing is it always appears with the right sign. So for those purposes, you don't care about very big, I mean, positive Ricci curvature only helps you with those kind of uh, Weizenbach formula arguments. So th this approximation fact means that we can fit into, w without any more ado, into the general kind of oh, chica colding theory that our, our limit, our, our gromov hausdorff limit, will be a limit of Riemannian manifolds of positive Ricci curvature. <coughs> Do we have a GH limit? So, um, Not sure what, what notation we use for this, <coughs> but so we, we, let, let me say something more about the singular set S, the singular set, about the general uh, Chica Colding theory or sigma we call it. The one divides this up or stratifies this to subsets like let's say sigma i. These these are the points where so no tangent cone splits off a C n minus i plus 1 factor for i being equal to 1. So in fact, what, what this means, the whole singular set is equal to sigma 1. All that's saying is that if we have a tangent, so if i is 1, this is Cn, if we have a tangent cone which is Cn, in fact, we're at a, we're a regular point, we're not at a singular point. No, that's not, which is a, a basic fact. Uh, but then there are subsets, sigma 2, and so on. So the essential dif difference in what we're doing compared with the ordinary case, or the first, most obvious part of the difference, is that in the standard case, We in fact have sigma is equal to sigma two. That's to say, there are no points that are here which aren't in here. There are no points which split off 
of Cn minus 1 in the, in the tangent cone. But now clearly, now clearly there will be. Um, th th there will be points where the tangent cone... So in, in, in our case, we will expect to find tangent cones which are just the model we wrote down, Cn minus 1 times C beta. There is angles beta. So, um, I mean, the, the fact that these don't occur as limits of in the in the ordinary situation is um, well, under super, in our Kähler under the hypothesis we're working with is a, um, a, a relatively deep theorem of Chiga. But but here we do we obviously are going to encounter these. Ah, so the other thing, the other thing to say about these things is that the Hausdorff co-dimension of the sigma i is at least 2i, the real co-dimension. So that's why before we had things of co-dimension 4 at least, because we only hit this sigma 2. But now we're going to get some co-dimension 2 singularities, obviously, because we started with co the whole The whole story is about real co-dimension 2 singularities. <coughs> So let's suppose we're at a point in our in our limit. Let's call it. Let's now Z denote our gromov hausdorff limit um, with such a tangent cone. <coughs> We'd like to do just what we did before around such a point. I, we wanted to construct these localized holomorphic sections around. Well, really on the smooth before we take the limit. But we want to have the same story. So what we need is a good cutoff function. So this is our this is our singular set in, in the, the in the, the tangents cone, and we're going to work on a big ball. What we want to do is to do do we need a cutoff function, which vanishes. Well, you have to which way you're going. You, you want you want a function which is equal to one on the singular set, sported in a small neighbourhood, and with the integral of as small as we like. That's what that's what we need to do. <coughs> so, uh, at first sight, this is a difficulty if you are meeting it, such a thing for the first time, because if you do the obvious thing, as we in our discussion before, uh, you would find that if you take the obvious thing, where you just take a standard function and scale it, this thing is scale invariant, so you won't scale this down. But uh, at second sight, or because you've seen something like it before, you can um, you can do a slightly more complicated thing to write down a suitable function uh, based upon so let's say r to be the so essentially it's a two variable problem because nothing's really happening in the other variables. So if we define if we define in terms of a pair of parameters q and delta, if I define g of r is zero for r. So I'm, I'm, I'm taking it, this is sorry, 1 minus the function I talked about before, well, r less than delta is equal to uh, 1 over log q times log r over delta if um, delta is less than equal to r is less than q delta. And then is equal, when, um, when r is q delta, this is 1. Now, if we work out, we want to work out the, the L2 norm of the derivative. Um, that's, that's going to be the integral from delta to the Q delta, 1 over log Q squared times, um, what are we going to get? Um, well, we're going to get 1 over r squared, r dr, essentially. Uh, we're going to get, so we need, that's 1 over r, delta to q, that gives log q, over log q squared, it's 1 over log q. 
Oops. So we can make Q as large as we like to make this as small as we like. And then we make delta sufficiently small, the function is still, so it's, it's still um, equal to 1 on an arbitrarily small neighbourhood. So with a, bit more, with a bit more thought, we can construct these good cutoff functions in the basic co-dimension 2 situation. And this is essentially the same as the fact that in, in dimension 2 you don't have a Sobolev embedding in C0. And if there were no such function, then you would have such a, more such a thing. <coughs> so this is um, maybe kind of the first step towards extending what we did to this case when we have these two-dimensional singularities. But there's a lot, there's a lot more to it than that. But I'm not. Um, I'm not going to try to go into very much of that at all, beyond to say a little, something else. I'll say a, little, I'll say a few more words. What have we got to? So, t more systematically, what, what we want to say is that we, we're going to consider tangent cones of our limit, the cone on y, and they're going to have a singular set, sigma. And we'll say that we have a good tangent cone if there is a, a good cutoff function. <coughs> so let's not write it. So a function equal to 1 on sigma, so the other way around, maybe this is 1 minus the g we had before, uh, sorted in an arbitrarily small neighborhood with the integral of mod grad g squared as small as we like. So I mean, I mean a family of functions, however small we want to make this, we can make it small. So clearly, if this was a, like a, a, a co-dimension 2 submanifold, for example, clearly we'd be all right by the same argument. But as we said, potentially these singular sets are you know, completely bizarre things. We, at, at, the at the outset, we know very little about these sets. So that's why there is work to do, but the basic, the basic sort of technical fact, the technical result, is that all tangent cones are good. So once you know that, everything we did goes through without change. That's all we use with regard to the the tangent cone was that you had this cutoff function, essentially. Everything that goes through. But this, but this, I say, this takes uh, a lot of work. Let's just mention a kind of a relevant notion, which uh, I call it Minkowski measure, but I'm not sure. I call it this because. Looking on the internet, there seem to be kind of vaguely related notions, but this may not be exactly the right language. But anyway, but, th but this is this is a good this is a useful notion for what we want to do. Supposing we have a a set called A, so in some general context, we have a notion of Hausdorff measure, which is given by covering by sort of arbitrary collections of balls with different radii. But that doesn't work very well for these purposes. What's, what works better is to consider balls of a fixed radius. So we'll define this by saying m of a is less than or equal to some number m if and only if, I mean, it's a way of saying it, it another be more explicit by saying if and only if for all epsilon, small numbers, there exists a cover of a by fewer than m epsilon to the minus, uh, see, 2n minus 2 is what we're doing. Um, um, epsilon balls. So this, this, is, this is if A is in some 2n dimensional ambient space. This is, this is, the, number you'd this is the number you'd expect for a kind of a, a real a real, real, so this is maybe co-dimension two, we should call it. 
Das geht mir schon. So why is this good? This implies that the that the volume of the of a Psylum neighborhood, I mean, <coughs> in a context where the volume of balls is essentially like the Euclidean volume, up, up to bounded factors, the volume of an Epsilon neighborhood is less than some universal constant times n times Epsilon squared. If you, if you just think about, because you, you cover an Epsilon neighborhood by taking these balls, but perhaps twice the size, they've got, they've got volume, sorry, this should be 2 minus 2 inch. The volume of each ball is roughly epsilon to the 2n. This is the number of balls, and so you get epsilon squared. So it's a kind of a good notion for a co-dimension 2 set. It gives you control of the volume of the neighborhoods. And if you, if you have this condition, then you can write down essentially this function with the taking this as the distance function to the set, uh, and using, the, using the, this bound on the volume of the neighborhoods, uh, it's very easy to prove that you have these good, good functions. So, r r I mean, that, that's it. the arguments are actually sort of long and complicated. But roughly, you write we write the, sig the singular set as um, something of Hausdorff co-dimension bigger than two union something of bounded Minkowski measure. Roughly, this is not exactly. Roughly speaking, that's, that's the kind of the idea. So anyway, the arguments revolve around controlling this quantity for the for the singular set. Okay, so that's all I'm. How are we doing? That's all I'm proposing to say about um, about this this part. Oh no, but I, I will say something. Yeah. Oh, not quite, I'll say a little bit more. Um, actually, the cases when what we're indicating in the picture is the case when the limiting angle is strictly less than 1, or strictly less than 2 pi. There's another case when uh, the limiting angle is 2 pi. And those um, require different proofs. I mean, the, in fact, the, the, the second one, although in a sense, you think it should be better because mm, you've sort of got there. <laughs> um, in fact, the proofs are in some ways harder. The, 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 the problem is when you look at a small ball, I mean, these, these divisors um, have a fixed volume. You know, they're in a fixed cohomology class, so that they have a fixed volume, whatever else we're doing. But we're,